nature not I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it I'm a nature nut today we'll go bird watching tomorrow we'll catch toads the next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut well I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it, I'm a nature nut. Hawaii, and I'm going to have a great time. We're not going to go snorkeling this time, though. We've done that before. This time we're going to look at seashore critters, and I'm going to be uh, joined by my friend Ian Sheldon. He's from Canada like me. He's a nature writer, an illustrator, and he loves seashore critters. So we're going to have a good time, and like I say, we're not going snorkeling, but I'm going to get it out of the way right now so I can concentrate on those neat things and the tide pool. Where'd that puffer go? Excuse me. Hey, hello. Hi, friends. How are you? Nice to see you here. So, you've spent all that money, you've come all this distance, and you're ready to just look into that tide pool. Just look. Well, that's okay if that's what you want to do. I got all the stuff you need. Look at this, look at this. I can set you up with one of these. I get them by the gross in Hong Kong. Little dip net. Oh, can you imagine? Right into that tide pool, you've got your tide pool critter, you have a look. Hey, that's nice. Put it right back safe and sound. Absolutely. And like I say, I get them by the gross, so I get them cheap, really cheap, cheaper than anybody else on the beach. And then, and look at this. That's high quality optical glass. That is a magnifying glass. Imagine. You put a smile on the faces of your entire family when you look through this baby and say, hey, folks, that's a hermit crab. They'll be thrilled. They'll be really thrilled and they'll remember it for a lifetime. You wouldn't believe the price on these things. I'm just giving them away. I really am. Having a little trouble with reflections? That's why you want to get these high fashion polarized sunglasses. Take those reflections, send them right back home where they belong. And for the photographers in the crowd, yeah, I've got polarizing filters. Same thing. Take those reflections, dispel them, and if you look at them with your polarized sunglasses, look at that. Ah, it goes from black to clear and back to black, and then it's clear again. You can stay amused for hours without even going near the water. I know what you're thinking. Yeah, and absolutely. Step right over here. I can take cash, traveler's checks, credit cards, anything you got. We'll have you set up in a flash. In Hawaii, the tides fluctuate very little, so most tide pools are really splash pools. Okay, well we're going to start with the most obvious things in the tide pools, the fishes. And Ian was just telling me that it's really difficult to identify these tide pool fishes with the existing guidebooks. Why is that? Well, you know, John, I think most people want to concentrate on the big, beautiful, colorful fish that occur just over the edge of the reef. So you've got to go snorkeling, you've got to go diving, and then you can see these big, beautiful fish. But if you're not into that, this is your perfect place to come to look at fish. Oh, yeah, and you can stay high and dry. That's and right. And this, this tide pool is just a perfect little natural aquarium, isn't it? It's even got its own filtration and aeration system down at the other end of the uh, pool there whenever a big wave comes That's in. That's right. So what kind of fishes have we got here? Well, one of the most obvious ones is the convict tang. Now, the problem is when you come up to a tide pool like this, most fish are going to run and hide under a ledge like this one just here. Uh, but then gradually, they'll get used to the fact that you're there watching them, and they'll come out and make their presence known. And these are the ones with the up and down dark stripes 
and the really flat body side to side. Yeah, that's right. I tend to think of them as wearing like an old prison uniform. It's a neat, very tropical looking fish, isn't it? Yeah. And am I right in saying that these guys here are some sort of damselfish? Yep, they sure look like damselfish. And there's another kind that's been spinning around here that has really bright silvery eyes, quite striking. The body color is kind of plain, but the eye is just metallic yeah, they, silver. They, they just glow, don't they? Mm -hmm. I, I saw a couple of those. Well, okay, let's talk about these ones over here because I don't know what those are, and I'll bet you don't either. The first time I've actually seen that fish in this pool, I think maybe a big wave brought them in and they don't really want to hang out here. They're kind of waiting out in the middle of the pool, perhaps for the next wave to take them back out again. They look a little bit like a mullet, but I don't really know technically what a mullet is. Yeah, they have that uh, sleek open ocean quality to them. Yeah, they do look like they're not quite at home in this pool. And what about all these blenny looking things on the bottom? Well, you know, just about every type we're ever going to look into has a ton of blennies. And uh, once again, you just got to sit patiently, look into the pool for a few minutes, and then you'll start to see fish popping out of everywhere. And uh, chances are that most of them are blennies. Do we have um, any hope of identifying them? Uh, not really, because not many people like to concentrate on blennies. But once you get close up, they're uh, really beautiful fish. They've got big, bulbous cheeks, bulbous eyes on the tops of their heads. So they've got beautiful characters. Well, it looks like we've got, I mean, there are various sizes here, but it, you get the feeling that we have quite a few different species in this oh, pool alone. You bet. I think there's something like 1,600 species that have been described. And there's probably even more being described or yet to be described. Oh, those, those blenny specialists. Yep. you got to be a specialist to know. Now, is there any chance that any of these might be gobies and not blennies? I mean, look, they, they go between the rocks, so maybe they are gobies. Uh, but then again, John, there's blenny of them. Uh, they uh, blenny right into the backdrop, too. Unlike their garden counterparts, sea slugs are among the most colorful of all the mollusks. Okay, well you might wonder why you'd ever want to bring an aquarium when you go looking in the tide pool. But an aquarium's a useful, handy thing. It's kind of your little window on the tide pool world. Just be really careful not to drop it and bust it on the lava. And if you do bust one, clean up all the pieces. Anyway, but an aquarium's a handy thing. It's handy in case you find something like a brittle star. Look at this guy. It's a brittle star. A brittle star is kind of like a sea star, or, you know, the thing that people call a starfish, even though it's not a fish. Of course, it's not a star either. But it's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's any kind of derm. And they're called brittle because their arms are always busted. So you rarely see them with complete arms. They're arms that are the same length. Very interesting critters. The reason I put it in the aquarium was partly to get a good look at it, because, uh, you know, I've rarely seen these things before, but also because they're fast moving. Right now it's not moving at all. But you watch this. I'm gonna put it in the water and then I'm gonna use the aquarium, just like a snorkel mask, to look down through the water and get an unobstructed view with no reflections. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Twinkle, twinkle, brittle star. Well, he's sort of moving a little bit. Perhaps I was, uh, eh, perhaps I was a little overzealous with the aquarium thing. Perhaps I'm a little overzealous still wearing my snorkel mask. Hey, I'm an overzealous guy. What can I say? This is a not overzealous brittle star. Underzealous. Well, Ian, I imagine most people would walk right past this one. It looks like a sand-encrusted piece of Hawaiian monk seal poop. Yeah, John, but it's a sea cucumber. Which is an animal. Yep. And I think that's really amazing. Let's talk about it. I mean, what, what do we know about this thing? Well, believe it or not, it's actually related to starfish and sea urchins. And uh, one of our best clues is to actually look at the underside of the sea cucumber. So what I'll do is I'll just pick up this sea cucumber very gently. Okay because they're kind of squishy. It's not dangerous, though. Oh, it's not going to bite me, that's for sure. <sighs> OK. So you had to pry it off the bottom? It was yeah, stuck well, this is, yeah. this is the clue. Um, if you look on the underside, oh. it's kind of hard to tell. Hmm. That would water. be the rear end. That's the, the rear end, absolutely. Of the sea cucumber, <laughs> yeah. and this would be the head well, and the mouth. Manner. If you look at the underside, there are thousands and thousands of tube feet 
Mm -hmm. And uh, sea stars and sea urchins have the same thing. Now, to uh, find out more how it's related, uh, we'd actually have to cut it open, and we don't really want to do that. We don't want to do that. And uh, some sea cucumbers actually have five teeth mm -hmm. just inside there mm -hmm. to stop fish going inside and living up there. Yeah, you know, if you had a problem with fish living in your anus, you'd, you'd really want a few teeth in there. Uh, yeah, I should think. So, Ian, uh, tell us about the famous sea cucumber evisceration defense response. Well, there's a reason why I'm handling this sea cucumber gently, and that's because if I was to provoke it a lot more, what it would do is eviscerate, as you say. And what happens then is that it thinks, ah, I gotta get uh, something to distract the predator away from me. So it kind of squirts out its whole intestinal tract. All the guts come shooting out the back end, and then the predator thinks, oh, yummy, chomps away on those, and the sea cucumber crawls away. It runs away. <laughs> <laughs> he runs at a sea cucumber kind of pace and uh, hopefully survives. Can you imagine that? I mean, it's, it's just such a non-animal looking thing. I mean, it doesn't even have a brain, does it? Nope. It's a very simple animal. Pretty much all it does, aside from ejects lots of water, mm -hmm. is uh, at the mouth end it just hoovers up sand and then gets whatever kind of nutrition it can out of the sand. Beautiful. Well, it's a neat critter. Let's put her back in the water. All right. The antique binocular glasses I wear in this episode are mostly just for fun, but yes, they do work as well. Well, you know, I was hoping to see an Opihi man here. An Opihi man is uh, a uh, almost legendary Hawaiian figure, a guy who runs out onto the rocks in the pounding surf. Prize Opihi off the rocks with superhuman strength. You know what opihi are? They're these, uh, this is the shell of an opihi. Yeah, that's kind of pretty, eh? They're limpets, and they stick right onto the rock. They're very important uh, to the early Hawaiians. You know, they really liked eating opihi, and uh, in order to get them, you have to risk your life out there in the, uh, out there in the pound and surf. So an opihi man's a very, uh, very important thing indeed. I've never seen an opihi man, and I don't think I'm gonna see one today. I don't think I'm ready to see one yet. Well, while we're here, we might as well talk about the PPP as well. Or pardon me, I didn't pronounce it right. It's very tricky. The first syllable is very short. PPP. The PPP is another mollusk. It's a kind of a snail, and they're much more common up closer to the uh, to the shore on the rocks. Little black snail. English name is black nerite, and uh, when they die, their shells make good little homes for hermit crabs. But there's no it's no big whoop being a PPP man because anybody can go find those little guys. It's easy. You'd think the thing called a PPP would be the uh, sea cucumber, but nope. It's a little black nerite snail. Whoa, man, this is the most incredibly vibrant, slugoid, mollusk creature I've ever seen. That's gorgeous, Ian. Is, is this a, a nudibranch? Not quite, John. They're a bit like nudibranchs, which are called true sea slugs. These are uh, head shield slugs, and some people like to call them cephalospidea. Cephalospidea, that would be my preferred term. Gorgeous. Dark, velvety black with orange filigree and electric blue-green splotches. What's the deal with that? That's gorgeous. Well, I think the slugs are trying to tell us something, John, and that's uh, we shouldn't eat them. Typically colors like that mean uh, I taste really bad, so uh, don't even try. That's so common in small creatures that are brightly colored, isn't it? That's almost always a, uh, a warning color and not a display. Do you know what those uh, long, flappy tail things are off the back end of these animals? Well, actually some people call these the tailed slugs because they have a couple of really long, flappy bits, uh, very, as you described. I always and, like uh, to use the proper technical term. Yeah, yeah that works best for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, when I was gently prodding one, not harassing it too much, uh, discovered that this really bright orange ooze comes seeping out of those tails. Yeah. I can see a little bit of orange mucusy stuff hanging in the water right there. Is that part of the, part of the story? Yeah, I think it's uh, like a secondary uh, defense strategy. If uh, 
if someone's not put off by the bright colors on a sea slug, like I wasn't, I thought, well, I want to touch this critter, uh, then it'll ooze this orange fluid, and it probably tastes really bad. So uh, if the colors don't do it, then foul-tasting brown oozy stuff probably will. And actually, when I was gently handling it, here it came out, all that brown-orange ooze, and uh, I think I'll be living with that for quite a few days, actually, John. It's a uh, souvenir of your trip. Yeah. That's really something. Of course, I love slugs. I love any kind of slug. I like just regular brown garden slugs. So this slug is... Definitely the prince of slugs, I think, John. <laughs> the prince of slugs. Did you hear that in there? That's a high compliment. <laughs> If you take pictures by the seashore, remember that salt water can be very hard on camera gear. Aloha! Well, you know, you stick around here for a while and you start to relax. And then you realize that the relaxation is getting deeper and deeper, becoming a kind of a tropical laziness. And then, then you realize that you're actually feeling kind of feeble. Kind of like the fabled tide pool critter, the feeble shrimp. I like feeble shrimp. They have a very laid back way about them. They just sort of hang in the water. I guess compared to other sorts of crustaceans, they are pretty feeble. I mean, you know, you compare them to a rock crab or, or something like a mantis shrimp. Boy, like the ciliated mantis shrimp. There's a tough looking crustacean. You can't really see their front legs. They're like a praying mantis. They hold them up under the head, but they're really powerful. One of them gets so big, they can actually punch through the walls of an aquarium. So they're not real popular with uh, aquarium people. Not everything's feeble here, of course. You know, a little baby raccoon butterfly fish in the pool here. Racing around, full of energy. Not like me. No, nope, there could be a moray eel swimming by. I wouldn't even notice. I'd just be lying here pretending I'm a feeble shrimp. They got great big bulbous eyes and transparent bodies, long feelers, and graceful movement. Feeble comes from the scientific name, Palaemon debilis. Same root as debilitated or debilitating. I'm so debilitated, all I can do is make the hang loose sign. Hang loose, man. You don't see that very often in Hawaii anymore. Mostly old hippies do it. Hey, hang loose. It's good, uh, good philosophy, really. And I knew that you were born So I brought you a creature From the rocks down by the shore It was wiggling and squirming Like an alien from space But I knew you were impressed Cause I could see it on your face Beach buddy Could have swore you were asleep There's a world out there to study Take a peek into the briny deep you say you don't want to snorkel because the mask makes you look weird. You'd rather not walk on the lava, it's so sharp it makes you scared. But you were curious about the little animals in the sea. Aren't you glad I came along now you can tide pool gaze with me? Beach buddy, could have swore you were asleep. There's a world out there to study Take a peek into the briny deep Take a peek into the briny deep Well, I saw you on the beach And I knew that you were born so I brought you a creature from the rocks down by the shore It was wiggling and squirming like an alien from space But I knew you were impressed cause I could see it on your face Beach buddy, you could have swore you were asleep There's a world out there to study Take a peek into the briny deep Take a peek into the briny deep
Okay, well, let's talk safety for a minute here. Let's get serious because the Pacific Ocean is big and sneaky. It really is. Now, you don't want to mess up your tropical vacation. One minute you're standing there, you think you're above the line of the highest waves. The next minute, you know, things change. The surf can come up or sometimes you get one of those rogue waves, they call them. You're swept off your feet, you're dragged across the sharp lava, you're thrown into the briny deep. Sharks are attacking from all sides, crabs are pinching you, you got octopus suckers stuck to your face. It's unpleasant. I mean, that's the worst case scenario. Best case scenario, you just get, like you ruin your camera or something like that. So you do want to be careful. You want to uh, stay aware of conditions around you and how they're changing. And remember too, to be, there are a few safety issues about the actual tide pool critters too. The dread rogue wave. Fortunately, I'm still standing because I was ready for it. Psychologically prepared, it's all a head game. Know what I mean? Well, you might be wondering what sort of footwear to go for here. I use high quality sandals just because they, uh, they're nice and light and they grip the lava rock well. Anyway, what I was saying is think safety. Yeah, and think safety about the tide pool critters that you're dealing with as well, both for their safety. I mean, don't be too rough on them. Uh, prying them off their little little hold fasts on the rock and things like that. But also for your safety, there are a couple of them that can give you a nasty sting. The cone shells and uh, some of the jellyfish. You don't want a nasty sting. Nothing like safety. It's making me nervous. And let me tell you, when you're feeling nervous about the ocean, there's no shame in making a run for higher ground. Tide pool gazing isn't just kid stuff. The ecological complexity of this environment is really beyond imagination. Ah, the seashore. How many of us have stood on the shore looking out to the sea and wondering what would appear next? The seashore, a place where the land meets the water, where the deepest fears of humanity are amplified, yes, magnified by the forces of nature. All of us have scoffed at the monsters that appear in the movies, on our television screens late at night. But think, my friends, think. The forces of the seashore combined, say, with the forces of mutation or nuclear power gone awry. What could happen? These are the forces that terrify you, that terrify me, and that terrify our society. Enjoy your houses, your new cars, for these things may not forever stand. Ah! Well, I guess that's about all the time we've got for the old Hawaiian seashore. Had a great time, but now the sun's going down. It's almost time for the sunset hula show, so we got to take off. I don't know, I had a lot of fun on that. Thank you, Ian, for your help. Well, thank you, John. Everywhere you go, the seashore critters are different. And uh, oh, geez, look at this. Tide's coming up. I'm gonna restock those tide pools. There we go. <laughs> we might get sucked out to sea, too. Oh, yeah, the big drain's gonna happen real soon. Ah, that's great. Well, I hope you get out and see some of this stuff for yourself. I know I speak for both of us when I say that because we're nature nuts. And we you hope you are, are too. <laughs> Oh, neat. That'll be all new stuff for tomorrow. Same time each and every week, uncensored and uncut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut. <laughs>